All right, here we are on the Prime Sports Network YouTube channel and Jess Root joining us as we talk Arizona Cardinals football. And uh, we haven't had an opportunity to do much of that lately, so I'm real happy to have Jess here. Matter of fact, we just finished a video that you could check out on our lads, uh, the our lads football channel. We'll have a link in the description for that. And we'll also have a link in the description for where you can find Jess's content for Arizona as the site editor of cards wire. And that's a USA today sports brand. Um, and you can also check him out on podcasting with the rise up C red show. So we'll have links in the description uh, for all of that uh, with Jess root in Arizona. Uh, Jess, thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Yes. And again, we just talked a little bit about uh, the top needs, top three needs, which again, you can check out at our lads. Uh, but let's go more in depth regarding those needs and many others in Arizona. And uh, tell you what, what we'll do in the meantime is uh, let me go ahead and let you and also the viewers check out uh, the depth chart uh, for the Arizona Cardinals. And this is definitely the best depth chart out there that you can find over on uh, our lads at ourlads.com. So uh, this will uh, give everybody out there an opportunity to join us along the way as we break down this Arizona depth chart, starting with the offense. So let's start with that wide receiver room, Jess, because this is clearly their number one need, uh, as you mentioned. Uh, and it looks, re I mean, I, I'm assuming, I haven't looked at a lot of mock drafts, but I, I would guess that like 98% of them have Marvin Harrison Jr. penciled in here. Is there any reason to believe that it could be another wide receiver? Um, if I'm they're sure all on the board. If they're all on the board and they don't trade the pick, but that because that has been most of the recent discussion of the last couple of weeks of whether they'll trade the pick. Okay. Uh, at Monty Austin Ford, obviously, last year, having gone from number three to number 12 and then trade back up to number six to get Paris Johnson. So he's a wheeler and dealer. He made, I think, five draft day tra uh, trades last year. Uh, you've got the Broncos, you've got the Vikings, you've got the Giants, maybe you've got the Raiders all kind of in the mix of maybe trading up for quarterback. Um, but assuming they stay on number four, I would be 95% sure that it's going to be Marvin Harrison Jr. with an outside chance of either Malik Neighbors um, and then maybe a lesser extent Roma Dunze okay. being a because all, th all three of those guys, I believe, are alpha receivers that you would immediately but like harrison is the absolute best okay. bet you'll ever have yeah. at a receiver prospect like he yeah. checks literally every single box and while someone might like malik neighbors and something like and you're when you're betting on a pick at the top of the draft like that there's no better bet than a guy who's named marvin harrison <laughs> who had that elite production for two seasons not only with an elite quarterback in a cj stroud but in a very sorry mid quarterback in last year at ohio state sure. with his physical measurables his playmaking skills his athleticism even though we didn't see him test we know what that type of athleticism he has and the mentality that he has, because we we know the type of guy that Marvin Harrison was. Yeah, so I, I cannot imagine him like he's had for me. Obviously, he's got the highest floor of the three, but also potentially the highest. You're thinking it's not it's not hyperbole to compare him as a prospect to to Julio Jones or A.J. Green or Calvin Johnson in, in that sure. talk. It, yeah. Should can, should we expect him to be those guys? No, but he's that quality of prospect. Yeah, and, and that's why I do think that even though everybody talks about the three, it's really Harrison, the two, <laughs> and then the rest. Because it, it's just so he's just that much better, and he is clearly the guy. So, um, uh, But again, w will they trade down or not? That's going to be a big question. What does the draft capital in general look like for Arizona? Oh, the Cardinals have a, they they don't need more picks. They have eleven picks, including two in the first round, six in the first three rounds, and then they've got five on day three. And so, like when you look at a team when you got eleven picks, you sure you want more picks, but if a, all eleven picks make the roster and they stay with those eleven picks, they all make the roster. You're really suspect about the type of roster that you have. So. They wow. don't need more picks this year. They don't need more picks this year. I could see where they in a scenario where they get the the Minnesota picks. They like future picks though. Um if they got okay. a future one out of Minnesota, that would be and then they could then they could wheel and deal a little bit because if they trade back, pick up the two first that Minnesota has given the three, 
then they might be able to parlay like 11 and their their other first round pick number 27 to move up to get one of the top three receivers uh, that they like still have number 23 so and then maybe a future pick as well I, but that's all I don't know it's we are so far away from the draft and it's been so locked in that Marvin Harrison is the guy we're coming, <laughs> yeah, up, right? we're coming up with stuff to, to talk about. And it's all I the other it. teams that are coming up with like We're, we're now at the point where, you know, I, I did, and it, it was, I, I'm going to call it an irresponsible mock draft, but it was just a scenario. It's like, what if, what if chart, what if Jim Harbaugh who said he would take JJ McCarthy first overall, but what if they wanted JJ McCarthy and they traded Justin Herbert to the to the Vikings and without <laughs> oh, capital, oh my but, goodness yeah but that that one yeah. <laughs> because that's you know that, that, that's, this, that's, that's what this time of year is doing it we're just is. coming up because there's so much smoke yeah and while there's definitely fire that's just all just misinformation out there going yep. around absolutely so, yeah but well yeah. look and that's the thing because you you, you do see all right three quarterbacks but but really the 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 catch is is if it's not for some reason if there's some sort of wow there's not a, a, there's someone else that somehow made its way into the top three but didn't want a quarterback well then you know who they wanted now they wanted yeah. Marvin Harrison because they, they don't did. want anybody else but Marvin Harrison <laughs> if they're going to move up and not if it's not a quarterback and if that happens. That is probably the most pandemonium. Yeah, that's when things. <laughs> uh, get here's a little here's bit. the thing. Here's the thing. I I am not like I. Everyone thinks it's going to go one, two, three quarterback, and I think it might go that way. But I am not one hundred. I'm one hundred percent prepared for that to not happen and yeah. have because it pandemonium like crazy happens every it year. It yeah. happens every year, and and I could see where the Patriots want a quarterback. But if they're not sold on the one who's there at three, maybe they have their eye on a Bo Nix or a Michael Penix so they can trade back for. Take and whether point. it is whether it is to trade to, to trade for a team looking to get that third quarterback or a team that's antsy that wants to jump car the Cardinals for the receiver of their choice. That I could see that I can see that happening, and I'll probably have one or two drafts in my in my in my editor ready for said <laughs> said things happening on draft night. Well, uh, I, there might be some Patriot fans because they know that they have had the most difficult time drafting wide receivers, and who knows? Maybe well, I know it's well, a different true. kind of organization in general. Their so receiving of... rooms as bad as the Cardinals. And they have had all sorts of bad choices with their top wide receiver picks in years <laughs> that they might just go, you know what? Let's put an end to that. We can find a quarterback next year or later in this draft, but let's just put an end to that and get Marvin Harrison. Right, right. Especially since they, Jacoby Brissett is a definitely a serviceable quarterback, even if they draft a guy that you're going to, you're going to be hard pressed to say that he's going to be significantly better with than Brissett. Sure in year one or yeah. that the team would be better with the rookie than Brissett. Sure. And so I, I can totally see that happening where they, I, that I'm not, I'm not 100% sold on the fact they're going to go quarterback, but I could see them taking Harrison to say, Hey, Brissett will, will be okay. And maybe we'll find a quarterback later on. Cause there's a couple, like whether if you can get Penix in, in, in round two, um, if you can get, you know, it was it Joe Melton, uh, the Tennessee guy, and you, you, you we got Rattler. You, well, oh, Mel, yeah, Joe Milton. I, I'm a Michigan fan, and uh, <laughs> I'm telling you right now. And I also watched him at Tennessee. The the, the he's kid, exciting. The kid <laughs> has an electric arm, but that is it. That is all he has. But no, now, no Spencer Rattler. That that's a oh, that's an intriguing yes. run. That because one. he was like he was as the kids like to say, him That's coming right. out, coming into college. And just was just a couple of years ago when everyone was talking about him going to be the number one pick in the draft before yeah. things went down in Oklahoma. That's a good point. So, yeah. And look, some the Patriots have had so much winning for so long <laughs> that you can't think that maybe what's in their head is rookie coach. Hey, you know what? We want Daniels. And if we don't get him, let's say he goes number two, we don't want May. 
And if that's the case, then okay, like you said, then maybe that's what they think about is let's think about getting a quarterback later in the draft, like a rattler. If that doesn't work out, we'll go get him next year. But not every team has to feel like they have to get the quarterback right away. They might just right. think, you know what? Because Atlanta did the same thing last year, and it's worked out pretty well for them. Yeah. They said, you know what? We could do it, but let's just wait till next year, and we'll go with Ritter, and we'll go with Heineke. We'll be patient. We'll play that game, and maybe the Patriots will do the same thing. So it's possible. I, I don't see them doing it if Daniels is there, but I can see them thinking twice about May because May's a guy that doesn't have a lot of experience, and he's the guy that I think is a little bit more hit or miss so it's possible yeah yeah I, all right uh let's now talk about i tell you what let, uh, so there isn't another receiver then as before we move on wide receiver on that in that room out of those other five like no names that fans outside of arizona should be paying attention to no i mean michael wilson um his college career at stanford was interesting because it was marred with injuries there is excitement about him sure but i don't because he had the injury history and it was it was weird because it was bone stuff so he had a broken collarbone and he broke a hand i think so it wasn't like tissue stuff he also dealt out with injuries as a rookie and so while he had some exciting games he's a he's a guy to watch he's a number two right he's a i would i would predict him he that if you get uh an alpha on one side it, I think Wilson's potential is a really solid number two. He's got his he, some, there's some athletic traits that he's got. He's incredibly great off the break. Like his 40 time was very average for receivers, his size, but he was in the, like, like I think the 93rd percentile in his 10 yard split. He's okay, that yeah. great off the break. He's yeah. really good that way. He's got really good hands. And but I, where they use him on the on the Z, I think he's a perfect match for that. Greg Dorch in the slot. Um, that's he, that's a really good match. He's he's basically he's the um, he's a in terms of talent, he's a lesser talented um Rondell Moore because he doesn't have the blazing speed. Sure. But he's been he's been more exciting. Because yeah, he, he, he he's 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 kind of a dog in that mentality. Like he makes things happen when he gets yep. the ball and he has opportunities. But that's a good match in the slot. But like, please let's let's not please not have Chris Moore and his twenty two catches last year be no. a guy that the Cardinals are counting on this year. No, that's why they, that's why they will be picking a wide receiver, <laughs> most likely Marvin Harrison. Okay, so let's go to tight end. And there's one spot. There's a couple of spots in this roster, and this is one of them where Arizona does not have to worry about. Anything for a while, uh, and that's the number one tight end. They have the one, one of the most exciting young tight ends in the game. You are well aware of that, yes. and it's so great to see, isn't it? When because a lot of times you get, especially second round, you get these kids. Tight ends are so difficult to to to, to figure out whether they're going to make it or not. And you know things didn't turn out all that great for year one, you were, and everybody's thinking probably same thing. Oh no, don't tell me another guy that has a great college career and just doesn't make it. And but then boom, boy did he look awesome last year. Oh, he was so good. It, it was fine. It was great to see him break out. And now I will tell you this, if from an Arizona perspective, they have had, it has been a cursed position. The uh, Trey McBride had the first 100 yard game for a tight end that the Cardinals had since 1988. And it was Rob Awalt. Who? <laughs> Rob Awalt. So, if, if back in the day they had two guys, it, Rob Awalt was a pretty talented guy, and okay. Jane Novacek. They also oh, had Jane Novacek. I remember him. Yeah. Yes, and both ended up going to the Cowboys. Jane Novacek had a fantastic career with the Cowboys during yeah. that dynasty time, and but the Cardinals just have had not. So the record before this season was 56 receptions by a tight end. Now, granted, they had a Hall of Fame tight end of Jackie Smith. He had a 1,200-yard yes. season way yes. back in the day, um, then went to the Cowboys for a year. But they did, they've they gotten basically nothing from the receipt, from the tight end position. It looked like Zach Ertz was going to be that guy. He tied the franchise record for, for tight end receptions in a season in the 11 games that he played his first year, but then injured that the ACL um, happened, and then he just looked slow after that. Um, then they caught him because he got hurt again and that's when mcbride um exploded 81 cats like he's he's a guy like you can see you he's a volume receiver too as well so you could see you could probably put him in this year between 80 and 100 catches um reaching that 
1,000 to 1,100-yard plateau this year if he's healthy the whole season because his per-game production after he basically – it's the first six games, it was basically nothing. He was didn't get used That's hardly true. at all. Yeah, it, it was – his production was incredible. Now, granted, he became the number one option because of the receiver room because Hollywood got hurt and Michael Wilson got hurt and then well, Hollywood – and then late in the season. So it was literally Trey McBride and James Conner. That was the offense. <laughs> the, late in the year and what and what's crazy is that in those games that kyler came back through the final eight games they were uh, in metrically they analytically they were a top 10 offense in in a lot of anal- in a lot of metrics and that okay. was with almost nothing from the wide receiver position and so you're saying mcbride broke the record by 25 receptions yeah, yes yes that's pretty impressive and, and it has i think he i think he hit number two so jackie smith i think it was 1200 something yards in okay. 75 i think mcbride hit the number two mark by hitting over 800 all right well he'll uh he'll, he'll he might break that so give him some time uh all right and then, so the question though is is what what's what's after that do they have to add another tight end at least one more to feel confident that they i don't know how, how often they want to run two tight ends but is that uh an important uh uh you know uptick they need there uh, they have so the guy they have behind him is Elijah Higgins. He was a sixth round pick by the Dolphins last year that claimed him off waivers, and oddly enough, was the most claimed player. There were five waiver claims on Higgins. Okay. Higgins is the type of player because he, he showed some he showed some promise late in the year. He's super athletic. Um, he would have been the type of player. If it weren't for Trey McBride, Cardinals fans would be gassing him up as the next good really? tight end. Cardinals have been doing Cardinals fans have been doing this for years. Okay. Um, with, <laughs> whether it be dream, uh, dream, dream. Yep. Yeah. Well, it, but because you you'd see you'd see some flashes towards the end of a yep. year. You're like, okay, he could be that guy. But you've already got Trey McBride. So Elijah Higgins, he can be a really nice number two piece. He has athletic. He can catch the ball really well. Uh, we'll see about blocking. The, the one thing they kind of need on the roster, I feel that they, and they might bring him back. They need a veteran blocking tight end. Just a guy okay. that you know is a veteran blocking tight end. Jeff Swain was that guy. He was perfect in that role. He's coming off a calf injury. I don't know if he's healthy yet. He was a uh, July signing last year. So I don't know if he's just waiting right now, but I would expect the Cardinals to either bring him back or add some sort. I, I would expect a veteran blocking tight end, but there's a couple of there's a couple of guys in the draft late that that I can think of that have some really nice blocking profiles. Okay, that makes sense. All right, so um, I, I you mentioned Connor, another big year uh, over a thousand, and most important and impressively, it was was not just because you wouldn't think this because Arizona's offensive line it wasn't like they were like one of the best in the league, but the fact that Connor and um, Dimacaro's uh, averages were yes. like five yards of rush. It's like wait what? Yeah, do a double take. Wait, Arizona? Um, why was that the case? How did they have such success running the ball, those two particular rushers? What was that more scheme? Um, or hey, yeah, they're pretty set here with these two guys. They 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 like they like both of them now. DeMarcado was was an interesting guy because like if you looked at him in college, he was a backup special teams guy for TCU. Um very there is nothing he does that's that's special. But he's pretty good at, at kind of all the things. He's a really patient runner. He's good in pass blocking. But I, I, I think he's the least. The guy The guy that's going to be exciting to watch is, is there's going to be a battle, I think, for that number two, number three spot because they oh, have Michael yeah. Carter. They got yes. Michael Carter coming back this year. Yeah. Uh, they signed DJ Dallas uh, from, from Seattle, and they've got DeMarcado. James Conner's the starter with, you know, with, with a bullet right there. And, and what I think what it is is that Conner – it's perfect for this game. Now it's part scheme. They 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 had a really good scheme running wise early in the year. Um, Josh Dobbs, his mobility, and I think what it is is that between Dobbs and and Murray when he returned is that that run game is very multiple. They were okay. and they add different things and facets. So it was a lot of scheme. But Connor has been like if you look at his career, the way people talk about him. The way players refer to him, the way he's viewed in the locker room, he gets kind of the same respect that some of the big time backs get. He just hasn't had the production he's gotten dinged with injury. Like you see the yeah. big name guys, you got the Derrick and the Bradley Chubbs, uh, the Nick Chubbs, and and then you know the, those guys at the top, and just just a little bit under that 
in impact and ability as James Conner. He's just never been able to put together a healthy season. Last year, he even missed four games, and he still reached 1,000 yards. He was an absolute beast down the stretch. The question is, Does is he able to – Is can he stay available the whole season? But yeah. the dynamic with him and Kyler Murray, and then you add in the, the flashy speed of Michael Carter – the the patient running of De Marcado, the, their running back room is really comfortable. What yes. can you upgrade from De Marcado? Probably, absolutely. A undrafted kid who was very serviceable last year, and and if if Michael Carter in year two because he also looked pretty good. But you've got a really good mix. Yeah, it looks like the, it. You've got a really bruising. He and and that's the thing is that it wasn't just volume; it was it was efficiency yeah and he was a more efficient runner over the last two years his first year with the cardinals like the year when he became fantasy famous when he scored 20 total touchdowns that wasn't a terribly efficient year the last two seasons when he's been healthy he's been a very he's been a much better back across the board very efficient just you know he's not winning everyone the fantasy points because he he had all the touchdowns yeah. for the cardinals in 2021 <laughs> Yeah, that's like expecting Mostert to go back and have 22, 23 touchdowns. <laughs> right. It's just not going to happen. It just doesn't happen that way. Uh, but yeah, Michael Carter, uh, that's a guy who could possibly be a number two running back on an NFL team. He's got that capability. So yes, it looks like uh, th there are a lot more problems in Arizona than to worry about running backs. Let's just put it that Correct. way. Um, okay, so let's talk about the offensive line next. And uh, it looks like with the, with the signing of Jonah Williams and also uh, with the uh, – pick last year of Paris Johnson Jr. that those are two spots that the Cardinals aren't going to worry about at tackle. Correct. So what about the rest of uh, the unit? A center position to me from my perspective looks like it's okay because you've got your starter coming back. They signed Evan Brown. Gaines was a fourth round draft pick. Um, mm -hmm. This is a big spot that looks like a, a major hole would be left guard. And then you, and then it also looks like to me that you, you probably can use some depth because you never know about Will Hernandez. But yeah, um, yeah it's inside that looks like to me uh, where Arizona has to get better. Uh, are they okay at center? I, I think so. I, I went into all last year. Uh, what's a yell to throw hold? I didn't know what yellow throw <laughs> who yeah. yelled to throw hold was. And yeah. the fact that you know when they signed him, they when they signed him initially, I was like, they're gonna do something else at center, right? Right. right? Yeah. Right. And they never did. Or actually, they did try to. And then he immediately got um, the, he immediately got injured in training camp. It was the veteran. Oh, the, the, the veteran center out of Minnesota. Can't remember his name now, but he's been on injured his whole career. They brought in a veteran center. OK, this is this is the move they're making two days into camp hurt. He, he's on air the rest of the year. Yelled for a hold. Um, yeah. Pat Elfline. That was a yeah. guy. That's Elfline. And, and yelled for a hold. He he is. His teammates, they love him. He's the strong, like he's the strongest guy in that lock in, in the locker room. People will say, um, and considering what he was, th they got more than adequate play from him at center. That said, I, I felt confident with him going into the year. The signing of Evan Brown is interesting. Yeah, yeah. I, there are. I felt that going into this off season with the signing of Jonah Williams, both tackle spots are set. Will Hernandez is entrenched there at right guard. He's very good. Um, left guard. They didn't make any splash moves at all, but they threw a lot of stuff at it. Last okay. year, they had four different guys start. It started the year, um, Elijah Wilkinson. Then he got partially benched and then hurt. Then Tristan Colon came in. He got hurt. Dennis Daly, Carter O'Donnell. And then it ended the year with Wilkinson starting with Colon rotating in. So they didn't, they didn't have like a 100% spot. This year, what do they do? Um, they bring back Wilkinson, they bring back Cologne, they bring back O'Donnell, they still have Dennis Daly, they also signed Evan Brown. I'm not sure what the 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 the, the plan is for Brown, whether it is for him to compete with Yelda at center or to compete at left guard. True. Because you also got the the kid before you mentioned John Gaines out of UCLA, the fourth round pick, really, really, really promising. Uh, they view him that he would have been their backup center last year. So okay. you've got him in the mix. And so basically at center and at guard, they've got about yeah, they got depth. five to seven guys that, yeah. that they're hoping work. So they didn't yeah. make any big splash. They didn't spend a lot of money. They didn't spend hardly any money on the offensive line, but they've got enough bodies with experience and talent that you feel pretty good. And even with the depth the way it is. So 
the tackle depth, you've got Kelvin Beecham. You, you feel okay about that. He's 35 years old, uh, had to start a left tackle at the year, and he's been a very solid pro his entire career. If you yes, don't want him has. starting every game. He's been very solid, and, and if you need him for a game or two, you feel really good about that. Um, but then you've got you know the, that mix. The depth is pretty all right. Now, you always yeah. want to draft offensive line depth to, to develop, but they're, pre- they're in an okay place with the offensive yeah. line right now. It looks like to me that, and I think we were talking about with the running backs, is that, but more so here, is that with, when is the second round pick by the, uh, the second first round pick? It's at number 27. 27. Okay. So it's one of those things where maybe at 27, <clears throat> if, if there's a guard that's still on, on the, uh, on, on, uh, you know, on their card, uh, and it looks like it's a, a bona fide starter impact guy, then maybe we'll do that. But if not, yeah, we can come back with what we have next year. It's it's not the end of the world. We have a pretty good amount of guys. But hey, if the right guy's there, then maybe we'll go out and get him. Yes, that that's kind of that's kind of the way I, I would view that. Like if if say uh, Jackson Powers Johnson is at <laughs> yeah. twenty seven. Yeah, I, I don't think he'll be there. But if he's there True. at twenty seven, yeah. why would you not take him? Because there you, go. you can yeah. plug him in immediately at center yes. or immediate left guard, yep. and then you say, "Sorry, guys, you guys are yeah. on one year deals, and we'll we'll say goodbye to you next year." And hey, who knows? Maybe if he's within five spots, that could be enticing enough with the picks Correct. that you got that the team has. Hey, we'll, we'll throw one or one or two of those picks later on, just because this guy's we just don't. Uh, yeah, let's go get him. He's he's too close. Let's go get him. All right. Um, I have to ask you before we go to defense about Murray, because this is interesting because you, I'm sure you heard it. Uh, as soon as the season was over, even towards the end of last season, people were uh, all over. All you were hearing, well, I, I was hearing was, oh, yeah, Arizona, they're gonna, they should just, they're going to just move on from Kyler Murray, just cut him or whatever, and just look at where they're at. They can get one of those young quarterbacks. It's time for, you know, the, there's no way Elijah, they're, they're going to count on Kyler Murray. So that is completely, from my perspective, silenced over the past yes. uh, couple of months. So it, it was amazing how people thought that way. Now, I didn't. I was like, well, why would you do that? It doesn't make any sense to me. But maybe they know something I don't. So was that even ever a thing? And what is his status with the organization right now? Well, I will say this. Kyler Murray, it, like Jonathan Gannon, loves Kyler Murray. Like okay. he, is, he is all about Kyler. And, and I don't so – the narrative that has been nagging, that's been, you know, everything has been said about he's a bad leader. Um, he's he's lazy. He plays too many video games. He's not a good teammate. All those things that were whispers from, and, and it came from the front office. And that, that's the thing is like the year, the, the offseason that he was due to get his extension, that Super Bowl morning by report by, by Chris Mortensen, I'm like, how do you let that happen? But everything, and, and when, then when they they he got the extension, and Cliff Kingsbury got the stent extension, and Steve Kime got the extension. The fact that one year later they jettisoned Kingsbury, they jettisoned Kime. Well, technically Kime resigned because he had health reasons, and he stepped away. Um, so technically that happened. You so you have a new head coach, you have a new general manager, you have a quarterback that's gone that tore his ACL. So last off season, it was perfectly reasonable to speculate that this is a make or break year for Murray in that, you know, and there was the talk that he wouldn't come back, like they would just sit him and they would get rid of him so that, so that they didn't have to pay him the money that is due in the contract. Yeah. They always went in this year. They always went in believing that Kyler Murray was the guy. Jonathan Gannon has said publicly, um, people say things, whatever, because coach speak that he took the job because of Kyler Murray. Okay. Kyler's why he took the job. And because he saw the what amazing things that Kyler does when he's on the field from the defensive perspective when sure. the Eagles played them. And so, but that said, I think there was there was a little bit of, well, we've got this year. We can figure we can figure out if he is the guy. I don't and I, I felt this from the beginning about about Kyler. And I think Cliff Kingsbury was a very good coach for Murray, but he also didn't challenge him enough. Because Cliff Kingsbury, to me, felt like the entire time he was here because he'd been chasing Murray since Murray was in high school. (laughs) He was chasing Murray was his whale. (laughs) And so he when he got him, it sounded like too often that he was he was just he was happy to have Kyler placating to him. Yeah. And well, that and said, Kyler, do your thing. Yeah. He is a guy. He's he's incredibly competitive. And I think he would have taken better to harder coaching. Lincoln Riley 
coach is really hard. He thrived under that. Jonathan Gannon came and challenged him. He challenged him from the beginning, said, we want you to do this. We want you to do this. We want you to do this. And Kyler did every single one of it. And guess what you're hearing now? Crickets. You're no, no, yeah. you're never here. You don't hear anything That's about right. him as a leader in fact yeah. you're hearing the opposite he's now grown in the locker room and part of that's his his personality he's quiet and so for a while he he kind of kept to himself or he would keep a circle of the guys he trusted most like the good guys like the stars on the team okay um and now he's expanded that so he he's in and, and he spent a lot of his off seasons before in texas working out the last two off seasons he's been in the building every day and so he's there when the free agents signings come in. Yeah, that's important. And, and yeah. so he's really turned to either he turned a corner or he was better off than anyone than people were making him sound. And yeah. everything that's come from the organization since Jonathan Gannon came in has been positive vibes. And Murray, I think, respects Gannon as a coach much more than he did Kingsbury. He liked Kingsbury. Sure. But the the way like he believes him and he believes in being challenged and he wants to be better and so those things that he's being asked to do now the things that he was asked to do early in his career when when Kingsburg built the offense around kind of the offense that he ran at Oklahoma that was really good to start with but it didn't evolve much yep, and now Murray true. wants to be challenged more and more and and I don't think there's this and when he came back the, I think the most important thing was the the way he worked the, the, the work habit that he had, he hit the rehab so hard. He hit the classroom so hard in the new offense that he was learning. When he came back from the injury, like immediately you saw, oh, he looked like the old Murray. So there was no ill effect of the injury. But he did it as a passer. You're just like, hmm, it, it wasn't quite there. And then there was the game against the Rams where it looked actively bad. Then he turned a corner. I think that he was the last four games of the year, last three games of the year. His numbers, he went, he went from very, yeah, fine, fine to over the last three games of the year, he was top tier quarterback, like great numbers. And and that progression, you have to look and now adding he's healthy this offense, this offseason, he's going to get all the reps in the offseason. There is so much excitement about what the offense can look like with him yeah. for the full season. Especially and, and, if you add receiver, get a receiver. Oh, yeah. Because the, what they did late in the year was with Greg Dortch, <laughs> Trey McBride, and James Conner. Yes. Now you get Marvin Harrison in that room, and that is gonna and McBride. Wow, that's uh, that's gonna be scary good. Um, and the room looks nice now because you've got a, a a really solid backup in Ritter. This is the perfect type of backup. Yes, I mean Ritter is never gonna be a long term starter in the league. He just isn't. That's okay. You can have a nice career in the NFL as a backup who starts every once in a while, maybe a year or two somewhere as a veteran. Clayton Toon, it's nice to also have a nice young player on the roster, a prospect. By the way, how did Toon look last year, and what does the organization feel about him? They like him. They like him. Now, don't ask what he looked like last year, because the one game that he extended playing time was against the Cleveland Browns when the Cardinals. That was the week before Kyler Bay came back. It was the week they traded Josh Dobbs, and against that number one defense, it was 27 to nothing. They got shut out. Yeah, Clayton Toon turned the ball over three times. He had 58 passing yards. It was a abysmal they he looked okay in the preseason they used him because you know with the with the whole tush push type quarterback sneak that that's prominent in the league they would use two quarter uh kyler is not a qb sneak guy he's never been a, been a guy that's liked to run the quarterback sneak and so oh, they yeah. would bring they bring tune in for that and okay. he was pretty effective at it and they ran a couple of alternate plays so it wasn't just they had basically three different options that they could do where they had it look like it was the the top it was the the sneak there was a pitch and then there was a handoff as well okay. that kind of looked like it and so they ran the and so but tune like he's very like i didn't see anything where like you're gonna be the backup and going into this year i thought they were just going to ride with him as the backup again yeah and and the, the ritter edition was really was i thought it was a brilliant move because he adds like because the backup quarterback market they're getting paid they're gonna pay a sure. lot of money it's important. and and what the Cardinals did, they it was a mix of low cost because he's cost controlled for two years as a second round pick. Uh, they got rid of a player who was probably who was expendable in Rondell Moore, so they got something for for Moore. Got a backup quarterback who's reliable and dependable and inexpensive, and so yes. you got and a guy who still has 
like has low end like because you see 17 games he's a very like his record what is like it's eight and nine i think yeah it's not bad he's a low like he's a low end starter in the nfl and if you're a low end starter you're you're pretty good you're or yeah. low end to average starter if that's your backup you're in a really good spot Exactly. That's exactly what that's for. And that's why I think he's going to have a really good career based on that. And that's what you want. Uh, sort of like Brissett. I don't think Brissett's a starter, but I think he's a high end backup. And uh, hey, if they need him for a few games, they can turn to Ritter and feel like they can win a few games. Tune, not so much. Give him another year or two. And then maybe when Ritter leaves, if he leaves, then maybe Tune can be that guy. Yeah, that, um, that's that's ideal. That would be ideal. Yeah. Okay, so uh, before we go to the defense, uh, the coordinator, you know, because this isn't a guy that, again, outside of Arizona, we don't really know who this guy is, what the offense is about. Um, so tell me, who is this guy and what's the offense about? So the their offensive court and the, the when the when they hired everyone, it was it seemed like almost everyone was brand new to the job. So, you know, Monty Austin, first time GM, Jonathan Gannon, first time head coach, Drew Petzing. First time offensive quarter. Nick Rollins, yeah. first time sec defensive quarter. Izzy Wilford, first time quarterbacks coach. So, so they have a whole bunch of guys brand new. And so Drew Petzing. Drew Petzing is like if you like he's kind of smart, but you wouldn't think of him as a but he comes from like if you look at his tree, he is a West Coast guy. Okay. And his and his background follows like you have, you go back it goes it it dates all the, like if you follow his tree it goes all the way back to Bill Walsh because Bill Walsh Andy Reid um, Pat Shermer he worked under Pat Shermer okay. uh, Kevin Stefanski and so that that kind of tree and that kind of thing so he is it is West Coast philosophy in, in that sort of sense and they do like to run a lot of two tight end and they they're very flexible in their scheme they like to run the ball but it isn't a it isn't a 1990s West Coast. Uh, it's it, it is kind of like if you like see what Andy Reid does, but not quite like Andy Reid. Okay, well that's good enough. And I think I did see the uh, I think what are they third overall in using 13 personnel. So that makes a lot of sense then. Um, uh, what you just said there. Okay, uh, defensively, as we make the switch to Rallis, so he calls the plays. Mm -hmm. He's only what twenty nine. He's so, ridiculously young. It's it's yes. It's very. I, I we're all jealous. Kid. He's a kid. Uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> and he was the linebacker coach under Gannon. So so you see the similarities there. Now I have a. Uh, this is a big question I need to ask because uh, this is part. This is one of the major reasons why I like having someone like you on. Because what when I do my homework, what I see is I see a defense with Gannon that comes from a four three, and I see the Arizona defense three four, and you know what? It really the personnel they weren't able to do what they normally are used to doing. So the question is, from what you know, is that what they're going to maintain? That's just the personnel they have. They're they, they, it's the NFL. We can go four three three four. We're just going to go three, four with this group, or are they slowly going to transition to a four, three? I, I'll say this. The fact that they maintained that three, four look shocked me. Okay. It shocked me. It honestly, it shocked me because you saw everything that they did in Philly and you're like, Oh yes, this is what they're going to do. And then they didn't. And so that was the part that surprised me because even when you looked at their time in Minnesota, their time in Indianapolis, that's the background. Yes. And so, and, and I know it's just for labels, but if, in, in, in terms of if you're, if you're talking about coaching, they still have an outside linebackers coach. He's still Robert Richard Rodriguez. He's still, and so it feels like that, that three, four scheme. So I'm very, one person told me it's one Philly guy and I don't know. And so I haven't had a chance to ask Nick or ask Gannon because they had uh, Vic Fangio as a consultant. That maybe there's a little Vic Fangio background or follower discipleship there for sure. that traditional look. I don't know. That said, the fact that they ran a three four, but it wasn't that's it's not the same three four that we've seen in Arizona for a long time because we've had okay. basically a three four defense with the exception of the Steve Wilkes year in 2018, essentially since about 2008. Okay, okay. Um, because Ken Wisenhunt, his defenses were that way. Um, then Bruce Arians had, had Todd Bowles, had James Betcher. And then since then they, when they, they had uh, Vance Joseph and Vance Joseph was a Wade Phillips guy. And 
And so the 3-4 is what the Cardinals have been running forever, basically. But this 3-4 is a little different because the way they rotate it out is that they ran a big nickel. So it, it essentially kind of became more, it was more of a 5-2. Like a 3-4 is kind of like a five-man front. 5-1-5. Five, five. Yeah. Five. Yeah. yeah, it, it could, yeah it, but in the yeah. nickel, rather than pulling, so they had two different nickels. You know, a, a traditional 3-4 will pull the nose and then bring in the nickel back. What the Cardinals did a lot was to grim, keep that five-man front, pull one of the inside backers to bring in a defensive back yep. and to maintain that five-man front. So that was yep. a slightly different. That's that's different. That's a different 3-4 nickel than, than what we've seen ever before because traditionally, like, like with Vance Joseph or James Betcher or Todd Bowles, they always pulled the nose. Okay. For that. Now the Cardinals did a little of that, but like they're they had the, the they had their they used a big nickel a lot, and so they okay. used a lot of three safeties. And and and, and you see you see one of the new guys, Tonga, it kind of fits that model you're talking about. Nose tackle, run run, you know, running downs off the field, you know. And that's what the they field. had. Lucky Fotu basically did that last. Okay, year too. all right. So that that makes a lot of sense because. The guys that they've brought in, it seems like they're still looking at like a three four. Just it just, just kind of looks like yes. that. Yes. Um, especially even by bringing in Mac Wilson. Um, but what I do see overall though is a definite need, no matter what, three four, four three, edge rushers. Oh my gosh, yes. This team on paper does not have edge rushers. And it's interesting that you 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 talked about Collins moving outside. I was a big Collins fan in college. Loved him there. Thought he was going to be a really good pro. Haven't seen it so far, but last year I think was a good step. I felt the same way about Cameron Thomas, and he had he seemed to come off to a good start early on. Uh, you can update what's going on with him, but so it's and then Ozilari was drafted last year, so they do have some talent there, but. Not a whole lot and nothing. Nothing. Proven. There's just nothing proven at all. Yeah. I mean, Dennis Gardeck, he had a seven sack season in what was it, 2020? I think it was. Then towards ACL, and but Gardeck, Gardeck is a stud special teamer who has has a pass rushing upside. So he's like an edge. He's like a pa, he's like a pass rusher. That's all he is. He's a yeah. Bring him he, in on pass he, rushing situations. He did play a lot of downs in, in base as well. And, but okay. like at his size, like at his size, he is a liability against the rush. Zayvon Collins became one of their best run defenders. And there's, there's a lot to like about him. And it was interesting. You kind of get the feeling of, it was interesting because going from Kaim to Monty Austin Ford or, or, or from Cliff Kingsbury to, to Jonathan Gannon, kind of some of the views that they had for prospects because Isaiah Simmons, when they drafted him, they said oh. linebacker that can do everything. When Gannon came in, no, I'm like, hey, we're playing play safety. And so, like, if it, it, you also got the perspective of these guys from from Philadelphia's perspective when these guys were scouted coming out of college. Yep. So, Damon Collins, like, he played inside. He was a Mike in college. He did move around a little bit, but and there was some talk around the Learsome buzz. Well, at his size, 6'5", like 6'4", 260, could you move him to the edge? When the Cardinals drafted, like, he's a Mike. That's what he's done. Why are we going to move him? Um, what, what, when the Philly guy, when Gannon comes over, when Austin Fort comes in, immediately they move him to the edge. And you're like, oh, so these two players that the Cardinals drafted to do this one thing, they immediately moved to do something else. Now, and Isaiah Simmons ended up not being a fit. Uh, for a lot of reasons, um, so oh yeah, we don't need to go down that. <laughs> but no, so but yeah, the, it's a, if like it, it's really weird because you felt like going to this offseason, they have to address the edge, right? What have they done? Yes. They've, they, they've done nothing. They, like nothing. Mac Wilson, they they had Mac Wilson, and while he did have a little bit of work on the edge last year, his they, they, he projects right now to be that second inside backer yeah. next to Kaiser White, but he's going to be that Wilson's going to be the guy that comes off the field on big nickel because they love Kaiser white is the guy Kaiser white's their dog in the middle of the defense. And so, but at the edge, you still have Zayvon Collins, Dennis Gardick, Bejo Jolari, Victor Dimikaji, Cameron Thomas, Cameron Thomas was a kind draftee. He looked, I, I was very, very big on Cameron Thomas and he looked so promising as a rookie. Yeah. His playing time disappeared in the why second half you, of the why season. Was that? He just fell out of the rotation. So I'm guessing okay. it was, it was practice performance. 
that he no. wasn't doing well enough. So he just wow. played himself out of the rotation. Victor Demikaji, he's got one year left on his deal. He's a he's a special teams. He was guy. He was a guy that produced more than I ever thought he did. But his playing time diminished as well. He's a okay. very strong run defender. He can play special teams. He's like. It, you know, Marcus Golden, he's a poor man's Marcus Golden. He's even slightly less athletic than Marcus Golden, but he plays the same type of way, but he's okay. not as productive. Okay. Um, Gardeck, we had the production from his sacks come in in, in bunches. But he does have, he, he's a tough guy to block, and he has one heck of a spin move that that he throws in there and so but but he's limited as a defender he really sure. is like yeah. he's he's a guy you love on your team he's a great special teams player he's a great leader he's intense you can't you'll, you his motor is wonderful but he has physical yep. limitations and so he's yep. a guy to love on your team but please i don't want him as my sack leader i don't want <laughs> no, him as my okay. sack leader no. if he if he has six sacks when david collin has eight to ten okay yeah. Yeah. I feel good about that. If sure. Dennis Gardeck is your leading sacker, your your edge presence isn't good. Uh Bijo Jolari, there's some there's now he 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 started the season slow because he had an injured knee all through offseason. And so there was he his playing time grew over the course of the year. And I know edge rushers as rookies are often not productive. And so okay. we usually see even the great ones, like Nick Bosa wasn't like 15 okay. sacks he, like like will anderson had seven sacks and he looks like an absolute monster yeah. um and so but we'll see in year two with with ojolari now with a, with a full year in uh, a healthy off season yeah. and i think maybe that the the issue why they didn't go out one that basically the edge market was old and the edge market is yes. expensive like, like yes, the guys that you could have viably had are guys who have like a mike dana who just re-signed with the chiefs like he, six and a half sacks, like he's a nice player, but you're yeah. paying a lot for middle of the road players or you're going with old players. And the Cardinals, they they have four players on their roster who are age 30 or older Four. that's it. They are going unless um, unless there's an exception, they are going with they're going and finding 27, 28 year olds, 26 year olds, the guys that bring in. And they're just weren't those guys that were realistic additions on the edge. And so. And but then you look at the the guys in the draft. You're like, eh, you're going to get much better. Like they must trust Ojolari, Collins, and Gardeck to be better. Because if they're not, no matter what else they do across the defense, they might. They're much better on the defensive line. They're much better at cornerback. But I guess this year, their defense was terrible. Terrible. With the additions they made, if they stay reasonably healthy, as long as they're not terrible, terrible, they'll be a decent team. They just need to be. You know, below average. Just don't be terrible, terrible, like bottom of the league <laughs> yeah. bad. Yeah. Improve, bring yeah. the bring the floor up to okay, maybe below average. Well, what does I'm because I would guess then, especially under your model of receiver first, Marvin Harrison, edge second, bottom of the first round. Who are you looking at as possible edge rushers that could fit for Arizona in the bottom of the first round? So the guy I like the best. Is going to be unlikely available in in Latu Latu. Chop Robinson has some great measurables, but the Penn State super athletic edge rushers just haven't produced in the league. No, much. they haven't, no, except they for haven't. Michael Parsons. But that because that became he's that a was freak. A surprise. Yeah. Well, and and he was an edge rusher in college, so he wasn't. He was a linebacker. Yeah, <laughs> he, was, he played off the ball. Yeah, and the Dallas right. Cowboys found, yeah. oh, he's special. So yes. Ebiketti is okay. And things like that, uh, but uh, Owe Odafe Owe hasn't done much, and so and, All right, good and points. Chop Robinson, like if you look at him, he's an, an an elitely athletic pass rush who doesn't produce sacks. Yeah, he's inconsistent, yes. <laughs> and so it, it's it's tough. Like you, uh, uh, like in a perfect world, okay. So if I wanted to maximize, if I wanted to maximize now, if, if the way to maximize both receiver and edge is to pass on Marvin Harrison, <laughs> yeah, right. Dallas Turner. And then if you can get AD Mitchell, cause I think of, of the, of this talented receiver class, I don't think there are many actual alpha dogs, but I think AD Mitchell is one of them. And and because that's what the Cardinals need. They they need more than just a, a nice producing pass catcher. Sure. They lack their alpha. So if you they and they're used to that. We've had Anquan Bolden, we have Larry Fitzgerald, we've had DeAndre Hopkins. And, and so you need that guy. And so if Dallas Turner 
or Latu would be the that that great edge rusher. Well, then you trade down to get those guys. Correct, and then and maybe some more you, draft capital. and 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 then maybe you go for like an Ad Mitchell, who I'm 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 pretty high on as as a potential um as that receiver guy and then and then double up and then double up a re- receiver so sure you could do that if you trade down yeah yes, absolutely but, but, then, you sense, out, but, but yeah. then you miss out on marvin harrison yeah, exactly <laughs> it's like that that's that's the problem so you can solve you can solve two problems or you can get a special player it, it's an interesting thing to think about, especially if another team that might be, who knows, maybe they feel they're Marvin Harrison away from being a Super Bowl contender. Right. And they're willing to go up and give you what you just couldn't believe that you're getting. All right. I know we wanted Marvin Harrison, but if you're going to give us that package, we're going to take it. And I and then I could see that being a hard not take. Okay. So um, secondary. Uh, this is another position that, uh, does not have a lot of household names, a corner. The safety situation uh, looks to be set Baker and Thompson. Um, by the way, uh, sh- how do you pronounce his name? Shashere? Shashere. 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 Um, where did he come from? Like he was, he was an Eagles guy. He, yeah. he played, he played for Gannon and the Eagles. He's kind of a special teamsy, you know, low end backup type guy he's he's there's nothing special about him but he's a nice rotation decent rotational guy and and he's saturated is the guy that got both playing time so could the okay could, could the cardinals definitely add safety depth absolutely that they they should like it would be ideal if they could draft a guy who is who could replace saturate and then ro- move into a starting role because i don't know what their plans are for buddha baker I don't know. Uh, at, at the with the safety market the way it was, I thought that they were going to have to trade or extend him. I'm not convinced they have to do that anymore. In fact, they might, you know, and it might not make him happy. Let him play out this year, transition tag him next year, then let him go. Because the transition tag will cost about ten million, and but then it still gives you time, and then you still have Buddha. But Buddha is is like the the guy in the organization. But I don't know if you can pay him. Like the when you're trying to rebuild your team, if you can put that much money at safety, because Jalen Thompson is also making. Oh, that's true. Money. Yeah, and teams aren't doing that anymore. Um, okay, so then, uh, but that makes a lot of sense. If they're going to add a safety, it'll probably be a, a, a middle round guy, late round guy to try to maybe be the future replacement for Baker. So then you take a corner. Look at the corner situation, and Garrett Williams was a third round pick last year. Besides that, they did add Murphy Bunting uh, from Tennessee. What is Talent wise, who do you think? What's the long term look? For, what do you think that the team looks long term as answers and holes? Well, I think Williams looked like an answer. Williams okay. looked like an answer last year, assuming he progressed. But he, like in his half a season that he played, and, and he the the fact that he played that way, getting no offense uh, off season reps was very promising. So Williams looked really good. Uh, I think Murphy Bunting will be an answer. Uh, he's going to come in, and while he's not getting paid top end cornerback, when did they pay him like eight and a, eight and a half million yeah. a year over three years? And so they view him as a two slash one. Like, like he's he's going to he's supposed to come in this year and be the guy. Like he's and that's what he wants to do. That's how they view him. Um, whether he is a high end one or whether yeah. he's an above average one, that that that's not to be known. After that, that's question mark. So Murphy Bunting feel good. Williams feel good. After that, you're like, develop? Keicho Clark started off really well. He won the starting job last year, and he was our fifth-round pick out of Louisville last year. Jonathan Gannon is a big fan of this kid, um, but he played himself out of the rotation. There's things he needs to do better. Star Thomas, he's got length and athleticism, but he also, like, he got picked on a lot. So did did they learn from that? So so, uh, you want to add talent so you don't have to count on those guys, right? Absolutely. So, <laughs> you don't want to go in. We're banking on this fifth round pick, undrafted, yeah. undrafted. So we have a room full of just one veteran in Murphy Bunting and then four second year players. Yeah, it's not good. That's not ideal. Add some top talents, but like the best cornerback prospects are at the top, and then there are question marks. So you could go Terry and Arnold, you could go uh you could go Quinion Mitchell, you could go Cooper DeGene, but those guys probably aren't there at Yeah, they're like in the middle. 
Yeah. So they're, they're there if you trade down. Correct. But, yeah. Correct. And then you get guys like Cooley McKinstry. You've got the kid out of Missouri. And they're they're all like and Jonathan Gann's a defensive backs coach by by nature. Like that's his how he came up as. And so and you and you kind of look at some of how their defense is played. They don't necessarily need premium, premium guys, but you can develop guys into premium-ish players and that might be the route that they're taking because of their scheme which they play a lot of a lot of zone a lot of off um because the, the philosophically it is don't let plays get behind you don't like and that's kind of that's around the league right now kind of, yeah. kind well, of across yeah. the board yeah they don't blitz much do they yes and no yes and no they're, it's not it's not so having you know vance joseph and todd bowles who are like blitz every yeah. down almost yeah. it's different it's different yeah. and, and and i kind of love philosophically i was like this is kind of off but i remember an interview that we had with todd bowles and it was interesting because you know the, the average football fan think blitz is for rushing the quarter getting pass rush right todd bowles said no you blitz for a lot of different reasons you can run blitz sure you sometimes blitz so that you take the outlet running back out of the play because he has to block and it's there's philosophically you're blitzing for a lot of different reasons and that, I, that was a very neat insight that i got from todd bowles a decade ago yeah absolutely that's why it's important uh you want to let the experts teach you um and if you can get them especially with those one-on-ones like apparently you had it's invaluable okay lastly let's talk special teams how was the unit last year and uh, what do they have to do to get better? Well, their special, special teams are pretty all right. They, Matt Prater, um, he missed for the first time in his entire career a game-winning field goal in the final two minutes. But it felt like he was following the script because if they won that game and, and that, had they hit that field goal, they would be picking seventh, I think. There you go. <laughs> so he was like, according to the fans, he was following yeah. the script. Good job. He, yeah, good job missing a field goal that he had <laughs> yeah. never he had, in his entire career. He'd never, but, but then you also worry about, wait a minute. Does that mean is that the start or something? Is yeah. that, is that, is that the, is that the over the hill part? But he, yeah. Prater is great. He was great last season. Um, they re-signed their, their punter, Blake Gillikin, who okay. was great last season. He was one of the best in, in average uh, he was he, he wasn't a guy that started with the team. They signed him after that Nolan Cooney uh, won this uh, he, with Matt Hawk, who'd been in the NFL, who'd been an NFL starter for years and years and years and years. Nolan Cooney flat out beat him out, but then wasn't very good in the regular season. Cut him side Blake Gillikin, and they've they've got that back. They brought back their long snapper, and so their special teams core, their specialists are fine. Okay, you can always do better in the return game. The Cardinals haven't had anything special in the return game since, honestly. Patrick Peterson and okay. even Patrick Peterson after his rookie year, when he had those punt returns yeah, as a touchdown yeah, that, after his rookie year, he didn't do any much. It yeah. was find the right angle, get them just amount of yards, run out of bounds. Um, they had a punt return touchdown in 2014 by Troy Ginn and a, and a kick return touchdown by David Johnson in 2015. And I think okay. that is the it. I think that's, that is the last time they've had a special teams return touchdown, like kick return, punt return. Uh, Greg Dortch is fine. Yep. when it comes to returns, but they added DJ Dallas and with that's the right. new kickoff rules, that's going to be interesting because now, now maybe we see a little bit more, but you felt all right with their, with their return units. They've helped good about the specialists and they have some really good coverage teams. They have really good core special teams players. Okay. Uh, Mac Wilson, great special teams player. Dennis Gardick, really great special teams player. Um, they're bringing back Bobby Price, who was one of their gunners. Uh, they did let Zeke Turner go, who had been like their special teams guy since okay. he came into the league undrafted in 2018 is now in the 49ers. And so they will see a slightly different look, but they've had the special same special teams coordinator and Jeff Rogers since, um, since Steve Wilkes, he's lasted three different coaching staffs. And so special teams, we always feel pretty good about. All right. And then uh, lastly, the unrestricted free agents, there aren't many left. So do you expect any of these guys to possibly get re-signed? Uh, Jeff Swain is the one guy that I, that I have my eye on is saying he'll probably, that's the, if there's one who they're going to bring back, he'd be the guy to bring back. Okay. Uh, we'll see about Josh Woods. Um, but he injured his knee late. I think it was his knee late in the year or he got hurt late in the year and he might not be healthy. And that's why they signed Mac Wilson. And they brought back Chris Barnes because he ended up being the starter. He was the starter at Mike backer after Kaiser got hurt. And okay. so 
And so keep an eye on Josh Woods once he's healthy. Yeah. Jeff Swaim also might be a health issue because he injured his calf late in the year and missed the right end of the season. So those are the two guys I'd say have the most likely, the, the highest likelihood of being re-signed. Of who's okay. left. And, and everybody else on the roster, no, no, uh, no other potential cuts, you know, all right, now after the draft, now that we've got the draft out of the way, we can cut this or that veteran. Zach Pascal is a guy I thought who would be cut already. Um, okay. Because Chris Moore feels like Zach Pascal, um, <laughs> yeah. and then maybe Dennis Daly, a Dennis Daly who, yeah, I'd say those are the two other guys that that I thought would get cut early on. DJ Humphreys had cut. Uh, that's a that's a that's a bummer. Like I felt that felt gross. <laughs> you cut a guy who tore his ACL, has been a team cap. Yeah. That that feels gross. Uh, but Zach Pascal and Dennis Daly were guys I thought there were locks to get cut. But maybe they just want to keep them around and cut them before the season. So, all right, well, awesome job, Jess. I really do appreciate it. Uh, like I said, don't get a, a, a lot of uh, time to uh, have a Arizona Cardinals conversation. Get in the weeds, get in the weeds with Arizona. Yes. Let's find out what is going on <laughs> in Arizona. And it's not like something that somebody ta- Hey, can you find out what's going on in Arizona? That's just that's not a, a question that gets no. asked very often either. Well, let's be honest, because the Cardinals have been bad for a long time. They're, yeah. they're, historically, they're one of the worst franchises in the NFL. One of the oldest, one of the worst. One of the worst one, but, but yeah, and... and a good Kyler Murley will change that. A good Kyler Murley will change that. Do have a Super Bowl, not a win, but they yeah. they were there. So yeah. a lot of other, well, not a lot, but there are franchises that haven't been. So um, yeah, it's uh, and, but you know what? As as a fan on the outside, it looked like they were like you mentioned with Kyler Murray looked so good at the end of the season. They, the, the Eagle game was so exciting, and it just did look like, hey, you know what? New coach starting. You know, Murray is playing better. Hey, that was a nice way to end the season to kind of get into the new season and everything's new, as you mentioned, new this, new that. So, yeah, it's uh, hey, you know what? Detroit started somewhere, too. And it took them a little bit every year. And I have Jeff Risden on as a Detroit Lion analyst the last four years. And we just talked every year about it, about the Hey, everything's looking good. They're kind of Risden's my guy. I love Jeff. I love. Yeah. So it was so maybe maybe this is the beginning of Arizona kind of getting to that point uh, where uh, they're finally going to get it. And it really does start at the front office. And uh, I don't know. It looked like Detroit did a really smart job a few years ago. It looked like they were turning things around, starting in the front office. Again, general manager, coaches. That looks like it's a nice uh, turn. And we've got the Lions former scouting director. Dave Sears as the assistant GM. So all those great Even drafts better. that they had, they, they they took Dave Sears. And so we've got Even Sears better. now. We've got Sears in the building who all helped right. draft what the lines are now. There you go. So um, anyway, again, great talking to you. And Jess, I look forward to uh, hopefully uh, wrapping after the draft because uh, it's going to be an exciting draft for Arizona fans. When, uh, when you're where they're at and you're two first rounders and a bunch of, what did you say? There were six in the first six three the rounds. First- Six in the first 90, six in the first three rounds, yeah. First, yeah, so that is awesome. So it should be a lot of fun following them. And again, we'll have links in the description of uh, where you can find uh, Jess's content, including his podcast. So Jess, appreciate it. Thanks, man. Appreciate being on. All right. Take care. And don't forget to subscribe, everybody. More videos like this. And again, a link in the description for our interview, the video that we just did in the beginning where we went over the top needs uh, for the NFL draft. You can find that over at our LED's, uh YouTube channel. We'll see you guys next time.